I was born in Tucson, Arizona and uh, still live there, although I left uh, Arizona to move to Los Angeles and then Oakland, California and then Portland. And I came back in 1976 and I'm still living there now. I graduated from the University of Arizona and then went to Los Angeles for my first job and uh, after my uh, four years at school. And when I got there, I, since I was from Arizona, I didn't know much about California, so I decided to join the Young Republicans since my mother was a Republican. I knew very little about such things. So I joined the Young Republicans and I, I walked in the door and uh, a fellow by the name of Jim, who later became, I didn't know him at the time, he later became a good friend of mine, said, why are you here? And I said, well, uh, Jim, I gotta know how to vote for the governor and which, uh, on which, how yes or no on Prop 101, et cetera, and judges, et cetera. So he said, no, you're not, you're here to read. I said, no, I'm not. I said, I came here to talk about, uh, learn how to vote and a little about California. And so he said, uh, I want you to read. And he gave me a book to read called Under Colored Treason. And that book, I read it and I was very offended. I was really upset because I felt the guy was right. And that's what started this whole thing. It, the, uh, that was the first of the books I read and then uh, people would recommend others and I would read other books. And as I continued, I started to notice that there was something going on here that I was completely unaware of, uh, even though I'd been a, a graduate of a university. So I continued my research and it's continued ever since. The impetus behind the book, my first book was the uh, was the fact that I was getting offers to speak to various uh, groups around town and I was uh, I decided that I wasn't going to use my ideas I would use the ideas from the books that I was reading because they said it far more clearly than I could so and I kept those notes uh, I would always lecture or speak with notes rather than doing it extemporaneously uh, so I decided to keep those things and they started to accumulate and I was asked to speak at a uh, a, uh, to a class uh, of uh, students at a community college in Portland, Oregon. And when I did that, uh, I just spoke for an hour with some slides, as I remember. Uh, the teacher called me aside, or called me later, I guess, and said, uh, You're a, you are a natural-born teacher. And I said, I'm not. I just came to the lecture. He said, no, no. And he said, we are still talking about you and what you said three, four weeks later. So he said, uh, how would you like to teach here? And I said, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not prepared to teach. He said, yes, you are. I said, but you have to have a master's degree to teach at a community college, and I just have a bachelor's degree. So he said, uh, no, uh, you've worked in the free enterprise uh, uh, field for 10 years, which I had done, and that qualifies you to get an emergency certificate from the state of Oregon to teach at a community college. But I'm willing to, to take it on as a challenge. So I did. With a, uh, it was a quarterly class, and there was probably what 30 hours or 40 hours of lectures. So, uh, and I would use blackboards and slides and books, etc. So I kept those things. And my students, there was no textbook for this because I was teaching the conspiratorial view of history, and so there was no textbook. And they were after me to write one, and I said, I don't. I, <laughs> here I was minding my own business, lecturing once in a while. Now I'm teaching. And now you want me to write a book, and I was stunned by that. So I decided to start looking into that, and I converted my lecture notes into a book. And I published it in 1985. It's called The Unseen Hand. When I was offering these students a different view of history uh, called the conspiratorial view rather than the what I call the accidental view. Uh, and I knew myself because I had never been exposed to either view, although in essence I had been because our textbooks teach us the accidental view. And the accidental view holds that events happen by accident. No one really knows why wars or revolutions or depressions start. And I was convincing them that they, they were planned and I called it the result of a conspiracy. 
So I was teaching him the conspiratorial view of history, and it was kind of interesting. I had 17 students my first quarter at that community college, and I was getting 30 to 40 students or people in my class every morning. So I finally decided to find out what it was, and I was, they would say, well, I'm the fellow's, uh, Jim's uh, uh, girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever it is, or even their parents, they were coming because I was offering them something they've never heard before and never been exposed to. And they were, they felt it was of great uh, value to them. And they were telling their friends and neighbors about it. And I was pleased by that. So I asked my, the students who paid for it if they minded if these people just sat in and listened. And they said no. So I decided that was sufficient. The spiritual view of history holds that events do happen, but they happen because they were planned to happen. And I'm contending that there, if, if a group of people meet together to plan an event that is uh, not uh, of interest to those that it happens to, those, it's got to be done by a conspiracy. A conspiracy is defined as two or more people acting in secret with an evil purpose. That means that people who want a war plan it in advance and, and generally have to meet in secret because they're going to involve a nation in a war that the people don't want. It's very common for people who have heard this for the first time to reject it because they have been taught the accidental view for all their life. Professors at colleges, teachers in high schools teaching history uh, don't teach conspiracy, they teach accidental view. And uh, there's a general reaction is that this just, just can't be true. But I've, I've dedicated my life to developing the documentation that it is true, uh, that there is a conspiracy at work and I've worked on developing that information from those that are directly involved or those who have done the research prior to mine and I'm convinced that there is indeed an active conspiracy at work in this world even today, and that this, this world is going someplace. And it's not gonna just be America, it is the world itself. And so I do what I can to expose that, make it public, and that's why I've written books and do seminars and lectures and talk shows. Uh, and every attempt is to educate people to say there's something going on here, and I know what it is. Ralph Epperson. He's a historian and a researcher and writer and lecturer. And we're going to be talking about the New World Order. Wait till you find out some research that he has accomplished. We'll be right back. By, by the way, did you write this book uh, from uh, a religious viewpoint or a historian viewpoint? Oh, thank you for asking. I want to make sure that people understand that. I'm reading the newspapers. I happen to be a Christian, but I wrote that book as an historian. I tried to document this from the works of the past. So there's no question. You cannot say, well, I don't have to be a Christian, and you're talking about the book of Revelation or something, world government and the coming tribulation, etc. I'm not doing that. This is out of your newspapers and the works of the past. Anyone can check my references. They're right out. There's no question what I'm, that I'm saying, what I'm saying is right. It's right out of their own material. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea a new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind peace and security freedom and the rule of law such is a world worthy of our struggle and worthy of our children's future we have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations, a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order. The first thing I discovered is that this, as I was researching this, 
is that there, this conspiracy is not something that's new. And as I continued my research, I discovered that it's not only not new, it's 6,000 years old, which means this, there's been an active conspiracy on this earth for 6,000 years, and we're now seeing the manifestations of it, especially now. One of the most commonly asked questions is, who are these people? <clears throat> but by, you let her notice, but by definition, it's a conspiracy. Conspiracy works in secret. And obviously, because their plans are evil and the people don't want the events to occur. So it's been very difficult to develop the information as to who these people are. We know much about the people at the lower, lower end of this, the lower end. And we are, my job is trying to go above them to find out who these people are. But I want to make this one comment. Last time I heard, something like 60, 60 to 80 percent of the American people believe there was a conspiracy that killed President John Kennedy. And by the way, there was. And, but we don't know who did it. So we know that it occurred, but we don't know why. And once we know that it occurred, we can prevent it from happening again to another president. And that's my point. It, to my mind, it's not essential that we know exactly who these people are. All we need to know is that they're doing this and we're going to stop it. We're not going to allow it to happen. Your commentator is Joe O'Brien. On December 7, 1941, Japan, like its infamous Axis partners, struck first and declared war afterwards. Costly to our Navy was the loss of war vessels, airplanes and equipment, but more costly to Japan was the effectiveness of its foul attack in immediately unifying America in its determination to fight and win the war thrust upon it and to win the peace that will follow. For instance, we now know that Pearl Harbor occurred at clearly established by history, but we uh, now know for certain that President Franklin Roosevelt did know in advance. So now, who ordered him to do that or why, we might never know. But we do know that uh, Pearl Harbor was, the, uh, was known to President Roosevelt. He was sitting in the White House waiting for notification of that attack on December the 7th, 1941. So that's sufficient. Because once we know that people can plan events like that, our job is to make sure we don't allow someone else to do it to us as well. Someone, uh, there's a captain leading our ship uh, into the deep water, and all we've got to do is learn that fact is true and then replace the captain. And we will never need to know who he is. We'll just make sure the ship goes the right way. These people believe that America was committed to a secret destiny by our founding fathers. Now, I'm not saying that's what I believe. That's what they believe, and we'd better find out why they believe that. Mm -hmm. Because I don't like secret destinies. I'm a free citizen. I want to know what my government's doing. He says we've got a secret destiny. Well, what is a secret the destiny? The secret destiny is to give us the new world order. This man says that the secret destiny is concealed in the symbol, the symbols, plural, of the two seeds, seals of the United States, the side with the eagle and the side with the pyramid that we talked about yesterday, as you pointed out on your dollar bill. He said the secret destiny is contained in those symbols. So we better find out what those symbols are. Once again, explain the Latin that we're looking at on the front of the seal. Now, I want to explain it as they explain it. Now, you might come up with a dictionary that says something contrary. That's fine. I'm saying this is what they believe it means. Let's take the annuit septus on the top. Okay. In my rough 
estimation of what they believe, the word annuit means the announcement of, or the announcing of. Septus, the way I pronounce it, means conception, the birth of. Conception is the Latin root, I guess. So they're announcing the birth of something, and the bottom tells us what they're announcing the birth of. The nobos ordo seclorum. Nobos is Latin for new, ordo is Latin for order, and the word seclorum has a root in the word secular, secularis, which means worldly. We call humanism secular humanism. And you look up the word in the dictionary, it refers to a worldly view of man without a belief in God. So we're announcing the birth of the new world order. That's what the secret destiny is. What? The new world order. There's a uh, doctrine called the Hegelian dialectic, which might explain this a little more satisfactorily. I'm going to use my hands if I may. Uh, the dialectic teaches that the thesis, which is a position on a, some issue, is offered, and then the countering uh, position is called the antithesis. And so those two struggle over the issue, uh, and one side ultimately prevails, and you get what I call the synthesis. So the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis is what results. So the, it behooves those who want this particular synthesis to involve the debate to make the American people, for instance, you believe that 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 event was debated and we determined what we wanted, and that was the synthesis. That means that if you control the thesis, you've got to also control the antithesis to get to the synthesis that you wanted originally. And that's what they do. They provoke a Pearl Harbor event, they deliberate the this issue, should we go to war or not, and then we decide to go to war because they provoked it, and then we get into the war, and that's what they wanted originally. And that's been tried on the American people. And once you understand this Hegelian dialectic, many of the events start to make sense. They control both sides, the debate ensues, and then out of that comes the synthesis, and that's what they wanted originally. To understand the attack on September the 11th, uh, uh, 2001, it's very easy to establish the fact that our government has a policy, those running our government, in fact, those behind the, the people in our government have a policy of uh, not going to war unless we're attacked. And I've developed the information that the uh, sinking of the Lusitania was intentional by uh, our government and Winston Churchill of the English government to provoke a, an event that would anger the American people enough to be willing to go to, into a war that we didn't want to go into. Uh, President Woodrow Wilson repeatedly stated that uh, during the election of 1916 that he kept us out of war, but all the time that was happening, people, including him, were actively arranging for the sinking of the Lusitania so that we would get into the war. The American people would be angry enough because there were Americans on board that ship when they ship was sunk, they died, uh, they would get angry enough to allow the government to go to war. We know that's for certain now. We also know that Pearl Harbor happened because people wanted, a, uh, the people behind it wanted a, a major event, an attack on our nation, so that would anger the American people enough to be willing to go to war. So when Roosevelt asked for a declaration of war the next morning or a couple days later, uh, we it was granted because of this malicious attack that even Roosevelt planned as early as 1932. And that's a matter of documentation, easy to prove. So now, the third event that happened in the similar vein was the attack at, uh, on two of our destroyers in the Gulf of Tonkin to get us into the war in Vietnam. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was running in 1964 as a candidate, a peace candidate, uh, promising us there will be no war, we're not going to go to war, our boys will not fight in the place of uh, Asian boys, uh, and yet all the time that was happening, they were arranging our involvement in the Vietnamese War. And so they staged a, uh, an event called the uh, Gulf of Tonkin event that never happened. Robert McNamara is now admitted, our Secretary of Defense at the time, uh, has admitted that it didn't happen, but at the time we were told that it did, that anger allowed them to use that incident as a way to provoke our involvement in the war in Vietnam. And so now you can, if that's, if all of those are true and they are true, it's now very easy that we can connect that to the 9-11 attack because I'm convinced that our government planned that as well. And I would urge those who are uh, watching this video now 
to do the research yourself, get on the internet if you have access to it, and watch the hundreds of hours of uh, documentaries done by amateurs basically convincing you that it was our government that planned the whole event of 9-11. <clears throat> and the purpose was to get us angry enough to allow this, them to go into war in Iraq and Afghanistan. So we now know that I believe that the 9-11 event is a, the fourth example of how the government provokes an event to occur that would anger the American people enough to go to war. It's not that you're trying to make something no, out no, of this. No. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that up to your listeners, the P, uh, your viewers, those who are watching this material and those who read my book. You decide from your, on your own from the evidence presented that you can verify and document. Like in there, I'll quote page 321 of Morals and Dogma. And we'll all open it up to page 321 and we'll read if I quoted it correctly. In other words, there's something going on inside the Masonic Lodge that we've got to expose, we've got to explain. And there's something that they are in favor of, this new world order, that we'd better understand. It's a secret concealed from us. And the way they're going to give it to us is step by step by step, slow and gradual, until finally we're all going to decide what to do with this thing. And by that, that time, it's going to be too late. That's why I'm, I wrote my book now. Before this material started coming out, I wrote my book. I've identified it. You've seen the cover, the New World Order. Here it comes. Get ready for it. It's like a roller coaster. I'm up the top. I'm looking down. I see what's happening. And we're now on the way okay. down. Okay. They want a New World Order. And this, uh, a lot of people think that George Bush coined that phrase. Those of us who study this knows that that phrase goes all the way back. Napoleon talked about it. Hitler talked about it. Um, a, a lot of people throughout history have talked about it and there has been throughout history generally a sort of loose-knit plan that they followed and the plan changes with the times and the obstacles they run into but they've had this goal for literally centuries maybe thousands of years that's correct that's what I tried to prove in my book the uh, New World Order this thing it goes back 6,000 years I found that in their own literature the one thing that I tried to do, and I'm sure you do the same thing, Bill, is that we can find their footprints in their own material. For some reason, they've made it available to us. It takes a little while to dig it and find it, but it is there. They put their footprints in the sand, as I call it. All we've got to do is find out that out and then go on the trail. It's there. Once you find it, you know where we've been and you know where we're going. I can't get over how beautiful this is. Look at this day. Isn't this incredible? God, oh dear. You know, people who say there's no God come to Eager and stand, sit, sit right here and say I that. Say come to Arizona. Yeah. Okay. God, I don't, this is really a I don't understand that. In uh, conclusion, I would say this, America, if we don't prevent this from happening, the world we're going to live in is not going to be fun. I cannot envision a society that would tolerate permissive use of violence, anger, hostility, stealing, raping, murdering, and yet that's where we're going. And I know this might sound strange to you, but I'm telling you that's what this is. There are people on, in America today that want to live in a society where each man is free to decide for himself what's right or wrong. And if we allow that to happen, we are no longer free. It's that simple. It's happening right now as we speak. It's happening in your local cities. It's happening in your, being reported in your newspapers and on your television. There's something going on in America. And the future that they've got planned for us is not going to be pleasant. And I'm suggesting that you, it's going to take some initial action on your part to educate yourself as to what it is and then do all that we can to prevent it. I've never in my 40 years of research ever advocated violence. I'm not suggesting that even now because I can't, I don't want to. I'm suggesting education. The answer is education. If we can learn what this is, to confirm that it's real, then we'll know what to do. And what we'll do is replace the, those uh, views with those, the sound views of a moral responsible society where each man is not free to decide, but acts accordingly with some principles that have been determined years and thousands of years ago that are right. Do not harm your neighbor or his property. It's that simple. We're going to be taught that we can harm our neighbor and his property, and I'm contending 
that's not rational, not moral, and surely not something that we wish to have for America.